everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. My name is Chet Zar, and I am your host. Today, I have a great interview for you uh, with Marco Visconti, who's an author and magician and occultist and Aleister Crowley expert. And he has a book called The Aleister Crowley Manual that's really good. Came out fairly recently. I mean, not super recently, but this year, I believe. And um, yeah, just an interesting guy and really fun to talk to. And I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, what's been going on with me? I had my had such a busy week. Had a crash, like I often do. Saturday, Sunday, just completely burnt out. But um, I had my talk with Mitch Horowitz, which was great at Philosophical Research Society. Thank you, Mitch, for again, for doing that. Thank you, Stephen Reedy, for introducing us to the crowd. It was great. Thanks to every, everybody who came out. Um, met lots of cool people for the first time, and uh, it was really fun. I hope to do it again. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, working on commission stuff. Uh, went to see Mitch speak two days later when he released his book, um, Modern Occultism, which is also a great book. Uh, and that was cool. And what else? I just have, oh, had my 35th wedding anniversary. 35 years. Can you believe it? How many people can say they've been married 35 years? Not many. So, uh, just had kind of a chill anniversary. Um, what else? There's so many little odds and ends. Oh, I've been working on these little ballpoint pen sketches, drawings I'm going to sell. I need to keep bringing that money in so I can pay my taxes that you you may have heard. So I've got to I've got to somehow make a bunch of money. I still don't know how I'm going to do it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, speaking of, if you want to support this podcast, you can go to Patreon.com/slash/DarkArtSociety and join for as little as a dollar a month. And uh, we got no no new subscribers this month, but or this week. Uh, if you subscribe, you get your name read on the air. You get entry into the uh, private Facebook group and um, get the podcast a day early and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to support my work, you can go to patreon.com slash chetzar and also join for as little as a dollar a month. And I post everything I'm working on. You get uh, opportunities to buy all my work early before anybody else my time lapses, all kinds of stuff. If you're if you're uh, a real fan of my work, that's the place to be. It's Patreon, and it's only a dollar. Um. Okay, what else? Uh, oh, uh, we are sponsored by SkullShop.com. S k u l l s h o p p e dot com. Here's my latest skull I got from them. It's amazing. Um, great skulls, amazing skull replicas. And if you join at the $5 and above level on the Dark Art Society Patreon, you get 20% off any skulls, I believe, any of the skulls that Kyle sells there. Uh, I guess that's it. I'm trying to move this along, but I, I always am worried I, I'm going to forget something. I should write these things down, but I'm just, you know, I'm always just flying by the seat of my pants, trying to keep up with everything. Um, okay, that's it. Let's get on with it. This interview is super fun and 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 uh, really great. So here we go with Marco Visconti. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, Marco. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate you coming on the the show. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, <laughs> I love uh love your work. I've seen so many of your talks on YouTube and uh uh your your book is fantastic. Uh Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh The Alistair Crowley Manual. Been, it's great. It's been it's been a bit of a um how do you say a bit of a an adventure right for me because i never envisioned myself as a writer this is your I, first I book it right book. it is my first book absolutely first it's really book. good um 
thank you again. <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and I, you know, I, I, I say it a lot because I genuinely appreciate it because like I said, I, I'm very critical of everything I do. Mm. Um, so every time I see people finding value in it, it's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's good, right? Maybe, right. maybe it's good for folks. <laughs> right. And, you know, and when it comes to magic, all, all I'm interested in is to try and convey the little I learned over the years, over to like crazy 30, 30 years that I spent doing this stuff now. Yeah. Uh, try to convey it in order to make it easier for other that's, people. That's what that's what I got. I'm not finished with the book, but um, I got the audio, audio book, but I need to get the um, the print print book mm -hmm. uh because it's got all the, it's you're referring to a lot of like diagrams and stuff but yeah i think in the other in the other book you you get also a pdf but yeah i mean oh, okay it's better to yeah you, you should you should it's have it in better front, to have right? it in one one place yeah, yeah but what i um immediately struck me aside from that i like the, the narrator's great <laughs> he's, he's yeah, the narrator. hey, robbie robbie, robbie Stevens is really good I yeah agree. i agree it's perfect but um it it made me it simplified um uh Cro uh, Crowley's teaching so, so clearly. And it was like, you know, having a little bit of background and just general ceremonial magic and chaos magic and stuff. It's like, I could see it's like, oh, these are kind of like his versions of these yeah. golden dawn rituals. He just kind of like changed mm -hmm. them. And, and it was like, I don't know, a light bulb went off in my head after uh, um, hearing your book. Uh, it was like, wow, this makes sense because his writings are so difficult to understand Con it's like yeah <laughs> yeah quite convoluted right like i mean it, it's so interesting that when you read the introduction to part three of Mag liber aba which is magic into and practice proper like he goes on this kind of rant and say like i want to simplify magic for everyone and then it totally doesn't <laughs> right it, it totally does not right it's almost like um, it almost works like a barrier it, it, for people that are just casual people that are casually I, it, interested so it's like you have to work to get through it you know what i'm saying you, you know what I'm, I'm i'm not against that right i really believe that um this this type of practices this type of teachings do need uh, attention and dedication and aspiration right so it's definitely and in this day and age everything it's so you know bite-sized everything right. is consumed on the go there's we already have to fight against that tendency right yeah, right so in many ways to have something that requires your attention or requires your dedication it's, it's good i yeah, think yeah i also think that there's nothing wrong in uh, accepting that maybe not everybody went to university not right. everybody is it is okay to read you know eduardian prose um 100 so if we if we can find a way i, I think it's the, the point i make in the book right like this book my book is really like um, a starting point. It's something that you should you should read, practice because it's a practical manual, right? Like you should do the the work in it, and then if if you resonate with it, if you if you love it, if you did this, yeah, this is great. I love I love this thing. Well, by all means, you know, at the end of the book, I suggest Crowley himself, or I suggest you know the work of David Shoemaker, Loma Luquet, uh, many other writers mm -hmm. that went and do and did it did it right, like. It's definitely a book for the absolute beginners. And to be fair, it's not a book for the somebody who already is a telemite or somebody who's already right. is dedicated to it. I mean, at the same time, I had a lot of telemites coming to me and say, oh, no, actually, I mean, I know everything about this, but I really enjoyed it reading. I really enjoyed like seeing the way you present this material. Mm -hmm. Because again, you know, like the way I do present the material is the way that it was presented to me uh, by my own teachers, right? And it's... You know, it's not always like this because, you know, we, maybe from the outside, you you might think that, you know, Thelema is very well organized in, the, in various orders. You join this, you join that, and it's very like it's one simple way, like everything is given to you step by step. Maybe that was Crowley's idea, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an idea that never manifested in his life. And certainly it's not <laughs> happening right now. It's, yeah, definitely, right. <laughs> it's definitely not happening right now. So for instance, the AA lineage that I joined, which is not even one of the, uh, of the main ones, so it's whatever I found in, in Italy, in Rome, when I was looking for it, uh, they were really um I mean, they, they had a golden dome background as well so we're like well you know what exactly like i write in the book well you know in order to move to telemic magic proper 
you have to you have to have this background right because Curly had this background right and he, he, he kind of expected his students to have this background as well and you know then he, he also super simplified certain things so maybe certain things is better not to have them super simplified because then you miss some points you miss mm -hmm. some important steps you know I, I use this idea of uh, building a magical pyramid and I think, I mean, if, I just love pyramids, to be fair. <laughs> so it's like, say, it's a good yeah, shape. Yeah, let's go for that. It's like, I say, yeah, let's go for that. Um, but the reality is that also, I read, you know, the pyramid represents, in many ways, you can see it as a representation, a solid representation of the rays of the sun. And the sun, of course, you know, is the, the, the end goal of these initial steps towards enlightenment and uh, spiritual attainment, which is, you know, knowing your true will and mm -hmm. finding the, um, um, the knowledge and conversation with Hoyer get an angel but of course that's that's the end of it that's the, right that's the end well, i wouldn't say it's the end of this book this book prepares you to consider running that marathon right <laughs> that's what I do. but then you know that is yeah that, yeah, is, yeah that is that is for another day i suppose you know that's uh, the funny thing about magic in general is that um yeah we were we were talking beforehand uh before i started recording i you know I've had this magical mind sense, mindset since I was a kid because through my mother, I think, and there's always been just weirdness around my mom's side of the family and people seeing ghosts and premonitions and all kinds of weird stuff. And uh, my mom taught me this creative visualization, which is the new wave, uh, new age version of magic, kind of manifesting, yeah. manifestation magic. And it always worked for me. She taught me when I was like nine years old and I would always do it when I needed like some money for supplies for makeup effects or whatever and it always worked and it so i just it was just part of my life but as i uh you know i don't know five or six years ago started trying to learn like you know i'm gonna maybe learn the learn it a little more traditionally and just learn more about it and and the first thing that struck me was like how christiany it was for one thing yeah <laughs> and how like uh, you know, angels, and it was not what I expected at all. Everyone who thinks of the occult or magic, they think it's like, you know how people think. Your Absolutely. average person thinks it's like devil worship and all this evil, weird shit. And it's like, it's so the opposite. It's the opposite of what people think it is, really. It's like the, the polar opposite of what people think it is, even though there's, you know, elements of talking to demon demons you know yeah, however yeah. you d define that and stuff the, it's it's all about enlightenment really you know it's about enlightenment it's it's like i a, mean i would say you right? know, i would say that's that that is definitely the um the strand that comes from the hermetic order of the golden dawn like mm -hmm. we we really owe to this bunch of people in in london 150 something years ago i'm terrible with maths uh pretty much like they redefined the way we understand um ceremonial magic magic in in the west okay uh, uh, there are different strands that that are more contemporary now uh -huh. for instance like in the last 10 years or so there's been a huge revival of the grimoire tradition and uh, and they will if you speak with you know with acarsis they will really hate the golden dawn and everything that is that they've done um i like remorse but i like i like the style of magic that i was trained with right <laughs> and 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 you're right like when you really look into it um it's incredibly christian is, is it a christian is esoteric christianity by right the means, right yeah like, yeah like the the entirety of the golden dawn is esoteric christianity and then there's a patina of egyptian on top right like you have the the central myth is the myth of christian rosenkreuz so rosicrucianism which mm -hmm. is esoteric christianity but in on top of that they painted you know all the uh almost like an exterior on uh, on everything that the all images and myths that dates back to to, to, to Egypt, oh, I would say as much as they knew of Egypt. So right. it's, it's Egypt, Egyptiana more than Egypt, mm -hmm. right? Because, because, you know, it's whatever they knew in Victorian times, which was, by the way, also a huge uh, cultural uh, phenomenon at the time. Right. Here in London, like you you go all, everywhere, you find, you know, everything that's that's Victorian, uh, Victoriana, like everything that's um, is a Victorian architecture, 
five times out of six or 50 percent there's also some elements of egypt in it right because they, were, they were they were insane about yeah that, yeah right? that was just a thing back then <laughs> but the reality there is that you know behind all of that the message was always like christian like so because they were christians like right. the founders of the gold so they're kind of Golden filtering Dome. it through their yeah. their paradigm that they they came up their the the yeah. paradigm that they came up in yeah absolutely know? and and you know the reason why uh, i be you know, even if I do like the Golden Dawn, I was never initiated in the Golden Dawn while I went to Lema because I was like, okay, you know, all this Christianity is okay, uh, but I kind of like something else. <laughs> so mm -hmm. again, I kind of like whatever comes next, possibly because, you know, I grew up in, I was born and grew up in Rome. And um, while my family wasn't super uh, Christian, uh, we we didn't we wouldn't we wouldn't go to church on Sunday or things like that. Right. Uh, my immediate family, my extended family was, uh, but still, I, you know, I went to Jesuit school, uh, and mm. you know, you, you're just steeped into that sort right. of uh, culture. And I I wanted out. I wanted something else. Yeah. <laughs> now, now the funny bit is that when you really get to understand Telema, especially the Telema that you find in Ordo Templorientis OTO. Uh, well, that, there's a lot of Christianity there as well. It's 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 upside down Christianity, which it's not it's not Luciferianism, it's not Satanism, it's right. not it's. But Crowley, um, I mean, Crowley himself was born into uh, you know an exclusive brethren family. The exclusive brethren are the fanatical sect of the Plymouth Brethren, which is a fanatical sect right. of the Evangelics. <laughs> so it's like he it was like as fanatical as it gets, right? Right. And, and, and so his own way of, of of fighting against that background, also you know, as a you know a, as a bisexual person, as a queer person, I guess that's the way of we can, we can definitely think of Crowley as a queer person. Right. Uh, like he was really like, yeah, no, I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna have any of that. Uh, I'm gonna try and find my way out. Yeah. Now, of course, like, um, but yeah, Christianity is suffuses everything. Uh, some people recently, I remember reading on a forum. I really should stop being on forums. But hey, <laughs> it's, it's not good for your health. But somebody, somebody said something that was actually I'm a bit contentious, but not completely wrong. I think that you know, in the you cannot get rid of Christianity. It, it for the for the good of the bad. It it's a, the paradigm that it, that informed culture in right. the West for the last 2000 years, right? Like, uh, you might like, you might like some bits of it, none of it, uh, you right. might like more, but the reality there, it's, it's there. Yeah. It's still yeah. There. There's no getting rid of it. No matter what yeah. you do, it's yeah. in the language, it's in our expressions. It's just like, yeah. that's our back. It's, you know, that's our background. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, like, uh, in the last time, let's say maybe, 10 years or so, I I personally went and rediscovered it a lot. Because, you know, if you read Christianity from a strict alchemical perspective, right, mm -hmm. you, you which is pretty much what you find in um, in every esoteric Christian myth, like, you know, Christian Rosenkreuz, you can see it exactly as an alchemical uh, myth, pretty much. Like right. the, the myth of, you know, somebody going to stages of transformation and right. eventually being, you know, transformed, like alchemically, Transfigurated into yeah. something divine. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you if you approach Christianity in that way, I'm I'm one hundred percent behind it. Say, because yes. again, you find it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Cannot... <laughs> I mean, that's why it's. I think that's why part of the reason it has um, stuck around so long and become so embedded in the culture is there is this core truth to it. You know, yeah. at the at the deepest levels, you know, of course, the you know the the people that are the assholes nowadays that uh, or the religious fundamentalists of any yeah. era are always uh, uh, dealing with surface level understandings and not getting the deeper meaning mm -hmm. of it, and um, which is where the problem always lies. It's just you know, the same that, shit yeah. over and over and over. Um, you got to look deeper if you want to find any kind of meaning, meaning in anything really. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, Crowley is, is, is an interesting guy, you know, uh, also, um, just you the, the <laughs> <laughs> you know, just the, the perception of him is just, you know, like, this, it's so funny. It's this one dimensional, this evil devil worshiping guy. And, and when you learn about him, he's like. It, it really complex, really interesting, really smart. 
he was an artist also. He, absolutely. And, and yeah, like, absolutely. And, 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 uh, uh, just the, the you know, you, you have to put him in the context of, of the Victorian era. And like you said, his religious upbringing. And, and, and when you think about all of that in its totality, it was really pretty, um, I don't know, uh, kind of, uh, 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 courageous really to, to do the things I, he know, did in a way. Uh, Although he you had know, money behind you. him, he had he had money, which is the it's easy more easier you know, for people to have courage than have money. But still, he did it. You know. You know what the the reality is that every time you hear folks discussing Crowley, it's always like most folks are, are unable to see the bigger picture. It's always about pigeonholing him either as the monster or as the saint right, right? there's right. never there's never it's very difficult for people to find anything in behind funny enough like a few years ago i posted something called the post telemic manifesto which really it's all, all about to say you know like telema in the 21st century we're coming to the 120th year of uh the reception of the book of the law liber albo legends which is next year right and 120 years is an important number hmm. it's the the time it's it's you know there's a lot of like Kabbalistic and gematria behind the number 120. Mm. Uh, it's the number of on, which is an important magical formula in Telema. It's also 120 years, you know, when the, the pastors of Christian Rosenkreuz opens again, this idea that it's an important number. Right. So it's like, you know, how about by, by 2024, we as a Telemites, we just move past this idea of pigeonholing Crowley, either as a saint or as a demon, right? Uh, I got fucking canceled for that really? <laughs> because it was like everybody was like I, you know from both sides from both it's sides. like you know yeah from both sides like one side was like oh marco visconti wants to you know remove crowley so he can be crowley and the other side was like oh you're just trying to whitewash crowley right and it's like my point is crowley was an insanely complex character yeah you're right he had money uh he, like he when he when, when his father died he inherited more or less the equivalent of like six million pounds of just fuck ton of money. Yeah. And 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 by the, and that was like eighteen. By the time it was thirty, all that money was gone. So I'm thinking, right. like you know, I lived large for a while in my life because I had money for a while in my <laughs> life, right? A uh, good good paying job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and I was like, okay, but. I haven't spent that much. So right. How how large must you live if in twelve years everything is gone? Right. So. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Know, and and you know, as you said, right? If you have money, it's easier to be controversial because, of course, people will want will will want to be your friend. Like mm -hmm. again, again, this is something. This is something I know directly because, like I said, there's been a moment in life where I can say I was quite well off mm -hmm. and I, I had a lot of friends. Right. Because they didn't, <laughs> they didn't care about me. They care about the fact that, you know, they were coming with me to right. places. So I was paying for everything, right? And so I can see that with Crowley as well. It's also true, and we should not deny the fact that he was also a very bad person to the people that, he, that yeah. loved him the most, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, it's you know a lot of people uh, rightfully uh, remind uh, about you know Rose Kelly, the first wife, mm. which oh, pretty right. much he did like he did without Rose we wouldn't have the Book of the Law right. I think because she was there with him when uh, when he received it mm -hmm. in many ways she started it she she was the one who actually you know sent the first message and I think it was Dr. Stephen Skinner. Um, uh, you know, say that, you know, like since the, the traditional way of receiving a message is to have a scribe, like to have a scribe. So if Crowley was scribing, someone else must have been receiving the message and then someone else must have been Rose and then Crowley, right. you know, removed there from history pretty much. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't, this I, is, I don't know. I, this, yeah, yeah. The, the, the time, the, the sexism of the time as well, I'm yeah, sure played into absolutely. this. I'm not making excuses for the guy because definitely he was, no, no. he was kind of fucked up. He had problems. He was a person. He was a, he was a human being. He was, but he was like, he was brilliant. He was super absolutely. smart and, and, and yeah, exactly. very, very exactly. creative. Uh, but he was fucked up. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of geniuses and you know, like, are, it, it, you know. <laughs> I agree with you. And and the point is that like I, I I'm so, you know, flabbergasted by the fact that people cannot either choose either either right. Or, right? <laughs> how about how about we, we just accept that this man came, did a bunch of great things, a bunch of terrible things, right. like ma many others, like fucking Gandhi right. as well. If you <laughs> yeah, want if yeah. you want to go there. Anybody, anybody in history. Anybody, you know? right? 
But he left a body of work, which is impressive, right. and a body of work that, that you can work with. And how about we concentrate on that instead, as opposed yeah. of having yet, yet another like 15 biographies of Crowley every year. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not taking stabs at the absolute amazing job that Tobias Churton has done, but really we had Crowley, Crowley in Paris, All Crowley right. in Berlin, <laughs> Crowley in, which is, you know what, to be fair, somebody like me, it's amazing. I have all of them. I read all of them. Great books. But it's if not a book that Crowley... you want to write, <laughs> necessarily. Yeah, it's, it's like, how about we write about magic? How about we write about Thelema, right? Yeah. And of course, you know, I already, I can already, you know, um, have a glimpse from the future. But people say, well, Marco, you say that, but you wrote a, a, a yet another intro, intro book. book. Yeah, yeah. So the point is, that yes, because I need to, I need to have that book to write. The next one right, right. because <laughs> i need to i need to lay the foundation step by step i i think but i think your book is i don't know of another i mean maybe there is because i'm like you know not as steeped in the whole a culture as you are but is there really is there another book like the alistair crowley manual uh out there that really just like simplifies the teachings of the lama and tells you step by step how to do it very simply I mean, to be fair, um, I'm thinking of, for instance, like the two books that I mentioned in at the, at the end of like you know further readings in the in my book. Okay. You, you have the man, the magic of Aleister Crowley by Ilan Mayo Duquette, um, okay. which is he's great, which is a good book. Yeah. He's, he's a fantastic guy, um, great book. But he, that book was written thirty years ago, right? And, and you see it because it's, I mean. Lon writes way better than I do or I ever will, mm. but it's a bit, it's a bit stuffy in a lot, places. A right? lot has changed in 30, 30 years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the other one you have is uh, Dr. David Schumacher's Living Telema, uh, which is fantastic. But I feel Living Telema is a second step because mm. while I tell you, you know, let's concentrate on magic, let's concentrate, concentrate on re rituals, practices you can do to have a direct experience if you like this, if this is something right. you want to do, right? Whereby Living Telema is a much more philosophical, right? It's it's not it's not an, an advanced book by any means. I would say it's late beginner to, in, to intermediate level, right? Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, uh, if you ask me, is there exactly another book like mine? I don't think so. And that's also why I wrote it, right. uh, because I think like, so at least you can have this book as, a, as for the absolute beginning. I mean, like I said, this book is, written for somebody who goes into, I don't know, Barnes and Nobles and say, and, and watches, you know, find the, the crazy cover with Baphomet. It's all red. It's like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a book that I wrote for. I mean, I'm very happy that you're enjoying it, but you know, you already had your background in magic a little right. bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm even thinking, I'm even thinking of somebody like even, even less than yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And to be fair, I got that that kind of um, I say that kind of um, feedback already from people that were like, you know, I never thought I would do magic, and now here I am doing liberation every day and that's, because that's... I, I I really enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. You know, it, it's it's funny too because, um, you know, at this point in my life, magic is kind of integrated, and it, it's very. You know, th this is suits my personality. I'm very like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a typical artist. I'm disorganized. I'm, you know, I, it's I find my own way of doing things. It's just kind of how my brain works. And so, you know, I've got my my basic practices. I have my way of doing mm -hmm. things like magically and stuff. And it's just funny, uh, the way the, when you think of the perception of most people have is like it's spooky. Yeah. And scary <laughs> and weird and it's like you know in a way we kind of like that because it's sort of fun but but it's so not <laughs> it's so yeah, I, I not I, creepy and weird I, it's like it's like it I feels 100 it feels every it feels normal and every day and it's like i can't I, the only thing you know i think why everybody should be doing this in some in some capacity in some way that suits them and i guess a lot of people do through religion and stuff they have their own way of praying and you know, connecting. you know i think i think that that in the last maybe 20 years 20 years or something like that a lot a lot of magical practices you know seeped into them in the mainstream through uh 
Kriya Yoga, Kundalini mm-hmm. Yoga, yeah, yeah. Uh, mindful med- mindfulness right. meditations and things like that, right? Uh, you get a lot of these life coaches that, you know, completely stripped everything that, again, seems spooky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and then, but it really like, like the core teachings are the same. Right. You know, magic, as, as, as I write in the book, you know, magic with the K. Crowley wanted to use the K to differentiate it, you know, from stage, uh, stage magic illusion, illusionism, mm-hmm. also because the K has various, you know, magical uh, implications, oh, that's uh, cool. which might be true or not. Like, you know, for instance, Kenneth Grant famously stated that the K, you know, is the first letter of the Greek word ktes, which means vagina. And so the idea of, you know, like that's, you know, a little hint of sex magic, which mm-hmm. is, you know, the, the, possibly the, the, the fastest way of obtaining results with right. magic. You, you know, har- harnessing the, the, the power of the orgasm. Um, it's, a, it's a bit strange, you know, as much, I love Kenneth Grant, but, you know, every time he says something, you have to, you have to either believe it or not, because like there's no way of proving it. Uh, right. A lot of the things he, he gives it for granted, uh, you don't find them in Crowley's um, published uh, or accessible diaries. And as you were saying before, Crowley wrote so much that you know if if it was there, maybe we should find it. Right. right. It's also it's also true that a lot of stuff is being kept under. Uh, you know, under locked doors by the OTO. So maybe some something is in there, right? So something maybe uh, something that the, the things that, Crow, that, that Grant says we, they are found, in fact, in Crowley's corpus. We just we just don't have access to that. But you know, long story short, is also that magic at the end of the day is this unique blend of Western ceremonial magic without the K. So you know, conjuration, grimoire tradition, uh, hermeticism. And everything that was coming from the East that was fresh and new at the time, right. you know, like everything, everything about yoga uh, was completely unheard of at the time of Crowley. Like famously, the OTO uh, was originally formed as an Academia Panmasonica in Germany by uh, Karl Kerner and Theodor Royce, and their idea was to bring yoga to the Freemasons mm. because it was new, right? It oh, was wow. a new way. It was a new way of doing it. Right. And even for, of course, you know, yoga it goes into Tantra and Tantra, you know, the idea of sex magic, using sex for that, for magical rituals. Uh, and of course, Crowley just run with it, right? Also right. because it was very, very, very uh, inspired by the work of Pascal Beverly Randolph and the brother Ludovic Ulis, which was again, Barry Randolph is possibly the 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 real unsung hero of sex magic, along with uh, Maria de Naglovska. Uh, like, if you never heard about Pascal, Pascal Barry Randolph, look him up. He was uh, a mulatto. Uh, so in the mid 1800s in in America, a mulatto having a, a big business going was a doctor, and he was also writing about sex magic. Wow! And to be to be fair. A lot of the secrets of the OTO, a lot of the secrets of sex magic, it's all written by Randolph, pretty much. Crowley updated it, changed the the, the background myth, made it made it telemic, maybe, made mm. it made it first Rosicrucian and then Thelemic. And and of course it is inferred that uh, all these these ideas are ancient tech that comes from time immemorial right. and then, you know it, it it founds its way into human culture again and again and again yeah yeah but but a lot of, a lot of the stuff that you know you find like as a as the secrets of time in fact you maybe they're found uh in in books by Pascal Barry Randolph very <laughs> very easily right um but so you know long story short it, it's definitely true that you know this magic is something that everybody should do I have no doubt about that yeah um, I also think that if maybe if you if you find find it a little bit spooky, maybe that's a call for you to right. go and explore explore that. Yeah. Right? Okay. I'm not I'm not advocating you know to to jump into conjuring demons or angels for what matters or fey or spirits of any kind. Right. If you're not ready, if in my book I don't speak about conjuration at all, um, because conjuration I know to it to be like an intermediate to advanced level mm-hmm. if you want if you want to if you want to add these general three ideas you know uh, beginner novice intermediate adept uh, advanced master uh, it's like it's it's more like that at that level right because you have to have all the the, the practices down be, down well before attempting it right. so i'm not saying that that but at least try the earlier practices because it just like you're just gonna have great 
um, great feedback from you. Like your life is going to be better. There's right, no right. Yeah, <laughs> like, <it's>, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I mean. That's what I like about uh, the chaos magic approach. That's where so many people get get involved. Their their first little step into magic mm -hmm. is uh, sigil magic. You know, because it's so easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you, and it produces results and you go like, you know, the first time you might go like, okay, maybe that was a coincidence. And then you try it again. And the, there's a certain point where you're like, okay, this can't just be coincidence. This is working. Uh, Absolutely. you know, maybe not, it's easy to do that without having the safeguards up as well. If you're not really, if you don't really look into yeah. it enough and that could be kind of, that can mess your world up a little bit, but, um, I, I just, I, yes. I, that's how that's, you know, that's 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 a, a a simple thing, particularly for artists. Mm -hmm. You know, sigil magic is 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 a is a is a good way, I think, for artists too to kind of dip their feet in. And I mean, absolutely. Like you, you, you. I mean, I can I cannot draw a stick figure to save my life, right? But for you guys, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> like my my part my partner, she's she's an amazing uh, painter. And oh, cool. She's, she's she's great, and she is like that, right? She, right. She every every time we 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 do some conjurations together, then she goes there. She, she immediately goes back to the you know to the to, to the canvas and start painting whatever spirit we've been just wow, speaking with. Cool. And, and it's it's been interesting to see like that coming to life right so yeah. for artists my, my, for artists in general i would say artists of all kinds i was a musician for the longest time uh you know as much that was my job so i was always being inspired by whatever was happening in my magical life mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i mean like and i guess that if you're completely new to this sigil magic can be your gateway drug in a way right mm -hmm. it, it can be because again it's so simple even right. if you know like it i would say that it, you have to be consistent about it and you have to 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 allow for the magic to to happen to unfold because right. something you know sigil magic became super popular in the last 15 years or so yeah. thank you I, I don't know if you remember uh what was the name blue fook this guy on oh Disney yeah yeah art Yep. Right. Like yeah. I think thanks thanks to them. I don't know. I don't know their gender. So thanks right. to them. Uh, I remember that seeing those those simple diagrams. Yeah, that was so, so well done. done. Yeah, really. So good. well done, right? Mm -hmm. And and this was like for for those of you listening here, like this was before YouTube. You had no videos. Mm -hmm. You had nothing. <laughs> and uh, you know, remember prehistory. <laughs> and uh, I think that since since Bluefield put posted that thing and of course you have also grand morrison before yep. in the you know in the 90s with the invisibles like it, it became such a popular way to say okay let's see if this works let's right. see if these things can happen you know at the same time like it it almost like it went to a point that everybody was saying oh yes yeah, magic is simple why is not working for me and then you know every time i spoke with these people we're talking about the last few years you realize that you they lack the patience for magic to work like imagine like you know one big right. thing in magic is you know the getting uh rid of the lust of result yeah the the way the way i i explain it i teach it is that imagine that you know if you're planting a sigil if you're casting a sigil you're planting a seed somewhere it doesn't matter if it's your unconscious the collective unconscious it's in the astral call it whatever mm -hmm. we're not going to philosophize that but you're planting a seed somewhere if you immediately after you go and you you know move the the herd yeah. again and say oh, oh seed it's not grown yet right it's right like, maybe you, water yeah. it some more maybe i didn't water it enough and yeah. then you put more water and start messing with it that's exactly a good, that's exactly a good point. exactly right and 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 this is not something that i remember uh seeing you know 15 20 years ago when i was messing with sigil magic mm. at first right because it was a different time uh social you know, media was, uh, it's yeah social, exactly it's everything TikTok. was ever, everything <laughs> uh, correct like i was going there because i'm old i have to make a little bit of this kind of like sound like a fucking boomer but hey <laughs> the point is but i think it's true at the same time because yeah. you know time like life was slow yeah. slower uh, and 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 you knew that if, if okay this needs maybe a month right let's see let's see if anything has worked in a month right if it did work yeah okay great if it didn't okay because the another thing that you can say uh, maybe a magic does require talent it's like an art it's mm -hmm. much more an art than it is a science right and you know as an artist yourself you will know that of course you will get better you know like you know putting down the hours uh, getting better at your uh at your art you know it will pay dividends you kind of got to have talent at first yeah, at least yeah. a little bit yeah yeah you got to have something 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 to work with. something there 
for sure. I mean, I, I've seen I've seen it with music, right? Like I am I am a decent guitar player, right? Mm -hmm. But I never learned to be a super shredder. Same because here. I don't have, like, Same I don't here. Have I don't have talent for that, right? Same That's here. Weird. I try. I've tried and years, and I could never shred. But it's like I'm a good rhythm player. And songwriter. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm like you, right? Like you know, it's 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 you have to have the talent for certain things, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and the reality, you know, the the problem is that if you it's it's maybe difficult for people to accept that that applies to magic as well because while magic is for all as Crowley writes right and why magic I as I say magic is the birthright of humanity mm -hmm. I do believe it like everybody yep. can be a magician yep. but you also have to accept that some people will be at least in, in any in any given incarnation if you subscribe to the idea of reincarnation as I do mm -hmm. uh, if you don't you can just say that you know some people will be more talented than others and that's about it right and there's right. nothing about it. yeah yeah of, you know if if, if you if somebody who's super talented and never practices eventually you know you will you will be able to surpass him he will be able to have right. you know, more more results if you constantly train right but right. if somebody if you both constantly train and and you have more talent yeah. than another person you'll be better yeah, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately <laughs> you know like, like that's, that's it's just the way yeah a, just the fact of life it's, like, it's just the way it is it's yeah, like that it, with sport it, i could never be a long distance runner I got short legs. I'm short. <laughs> it's it ain't gonna happen. I when I was in yeah. junior high school, they made us run the mile, and I was always really slow. And I tried so hard, and I'm just not built for it. I'm just not yeah, my body. I mean, I just... I'm just not built for it. So and it's like friends of mine with long legs would just lap me. Going, you know. Yeah. I mean, so. I, and and really, that's exactly just just how things are. Yeah. Um. We we've been living in the last few years with this idea that which i think it's a good idea that we have all this discussion we had about gender about mm -hmm. equality it's fantastic we needed that but it also like another sort of uh, narrative sipped in that everybody can do everything right right uh i don't think so i, mean, I think that everybody can can have some sort of results with mm -hmm. when it comes to magic because yeah. again, we're talking about that but if you if you want to have like if you want to conjure Paimon and, and see the, the absolute physical manifestation of, of the demon in front of you, yeah, he, talent is kind of important <laughs> as well. As, I uh, mean, as yeah, yeah. Uh, I as far as you know, my my wife is has always been very talented um, with precognition, mm -hmm. like she's. All, all the time predicting earthquakes predicting all kinds of things she's got this kind of psychic ability and mm -hmm. um she she's seen she sees spirits and shit <laughs> she sees all kinds of weird stuff i mean i've we've been laying in bed once and she's like Do, don't you see that over there and i'm like no i can't see it she's no. like just she's like trying to help me just squint a little bit it's in the corner up at the top and i'm like i can't see it um but i have this i go out of body all the time unintentionally and it's like been like that since around age 12 where i just like mm -hmm. float around and i can't really control it and it's like my natural but ability uh, is mm -hmm. seems to be there but not so much yeah. in like precognition i've had a few precognitive dreams uh but it's not something i don't have the same psychic ability as, as her but i have more of an out of body yeah <laughs> uh talent yeah. than she and, has and you know and you know, like the reality there is that if you want to to train that, you can, mm -hmm. right? But it's yeah, like it's, the reality there is like you, you can, there's exercises to yeah, do yeah. this, there's exercises. Right. But as you were saying, like like if you have shorter legs, you will never be yeah. a long distance from right, that. right. That's how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like maybe lean into your strength, just like with anything, you know. It's like correct. That's how it was with music for me. I love music. I was in a band for ten years. I loved it. I wanted to make it before I became a fine artist. While I was mm -hmm. in makeup effects, I was like, I want to do this band. And um, I kept, uh, and, the, and the songs were good. I was primarily like into songwriting. And I, like I said, I was not a shredder, I was, but I was a guitar player. I taught myself to sing and I was a pretty good singer. And uh, I was a front man, which is crazy <laughs> being such a shy person somehow. When I had a band, yeah, usually, usually shy, shy people can can be fantastic frontmen. Yeah, <laughs> it's weird because it's, it's. I felt like if I was, I believed in the music, and that gave me the confidence to yeah. do it. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't me; it was like the music I was presenting. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, 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 I really believe it's like it wasn't my proper path 
because it's like I pushed hard for 10 years and I just could not break through. And, and yeah. I mean, I sent a demo. I met Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys. Okay. He loved it. And it's like the band had broken up by then. He probably would. I bet you he would have put it out on, on his label. But but so it was good. It was good music, but it's just like it wasn't catching. It just I don't know if the timing was right. was wasn't right. But it was I ended up, uh, 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 you know, the band broke up for the last time and I was super bummed. But it eventually led me to painting. And once I mm -hmm. started painting, I started getting all this like it was it clicked more and it started working yeah. better. Yeah. And then I was realized like, you know, before I was into music, I was I was a visual artist when I was a little kid. You know, it's you were like, already you were already on that path. Yeah. And it's like I got interrupted because I liked music so much when I learned to play guitar when I was like 16 or 17. And so it kind of set me off. It was fun and great and everything, but it set me off my true path. And then uh, any point being, I should have leaned into my strengths, <laughs> you know, all I along, know, you know, it, you know it, but at the same time, it was part of the journey. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, and I loved it because I loved you, music, I love because, you know, like, like, like the idea of finding your, your purpose in life, it is very, it is a very appealing. It is a narrative that comes back in magic again and again. Right. Uh, it's the idea of, you know, finding your true will in many mm -hmm. ways. Right. Uh, what I learned though, is that true will, it's not something that's set in stone. Hmm. Because a lot of people have this idea that, you know, you find your true will, one day something clicks, the, the angels appears and tells you who you are and mm -hmm. what you're doing, and that's going to be it forever. What, what really happens there is that, you know, at some point there are, like, there, there is a before and after, right? There, it's almost like, think about it, like having, when you grow up, you have this idea about sex, then one day you have sex, and it's the before and after. Before you had all strange ideas about it, right. and after that, you know, you had that union, you had that, that moment of ecstasy. That is similar, but the reality there is that, you know, the, the, the true will is more of a, you know, moment to moment experience. Hmm. It's almost something that this path keeps building on itself. Right. And from time to time, yeah. you take the tour. You do take the tours, right? But again, when you look back sense. at it, uh, as you're saying, when you look back at it, you know, the maybe for you, the visual artist was always there. The visual arts were always there. Right? Yeah. And so you know, no matter the, the tours you took in life, now no, you're doing what you're doing and you're great at it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's it. Right. And, 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 and that's it. Right. And for me, it was similar because, you know, I grew up, I was very interested in, in everything that was, you know, esoteric, paranormal, cult. Mm -hmm. And then I had my own detour because, you know, I had my experience with the Holy Angel. And, you know, I was set up to be a very, very... Um, Let's say white collar kind of guy, mm -hmm. you know, with a with a with a with a, with a serious job with everything uh, out of out of university, and instead I just left everything behind and I went. Well, I, I guess as I escaped with the circus. I'd like to say <laughs> I, I, beca I, be I became a professional musician in a super tiny niche uh, genre, which is you know electro goth, industrial metal, industrial um, EBM, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I did that for fifteen years. Wow! And you know, I went to, I went on tour all over the world. I played with bigger bands, with smaller bands. My my projects. Be, it's I mean, you know, for a band that hasn't produced anything in ten years, I still have like. 10,000 uh, listeners on Spotify, wow. which is nothing, well, but you know, it's nowadays, it's, it's kind of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, it's nothing in the biggest scale mm -hmm. of things, but you know, people still know the, 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 some of the songs I made, you know, became cult classics in that super niche. What's genre. the name? What was the name of the project? Was, the project was called XP8, as in XP and 8, but oh, okay. also you know, to XP, XP8 scenes and things like that. And then, and that's the, that was like my project that I ran from 2001 to 2014. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, ever since we released from time to time the odd, uh, the odd single, because it was really like we were three at the beginning, then we became, became a duo. And it's much, it's, I can't describe the music. You mentioned like you know, pet, pet Shop Boys meets The Prodigy, something oh, like wow. that. So, <laughs> so a, a, a bit hard hitting, but also melodic, so synth pop, but also mm -hmm. danceable. You know, right? And um, oh, cool. And then, and then you know, at some point, you know, like my the singer of the band, which is called Marco as well, uh, he just you know he decided to 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 settle, started a family and everything, and that was the end of it in right. any way. But you know, it's also like you know that scene 
had around at a lifespan like it was something was very it was very popular for a while especially in germany still very popular in germany here in the uk in the us a lot but you know in major cities like we used to, you're in la right if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. yeah so we used to play das bunker you know and oh, okay uh, so that that kind of scene over there um and then and then it kind of died down yeah but at the same time i also played for many years with this band called faderhead i did like a tour with vmv nation uh, i played with this other band called grendel so for three years so that i was doing that that was like my life right. for <laughs> 15 years right? wow and but the reality there at the, at, at the end of it you know when all that died down i went back to to do to the spirituality to magic to dilemma because it was the it was was there at the beginning as well. right exactly like exactly yeah. like you said yeah 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 so the point is that the tours happen in life and you know if anybody's listening and you still have to find your purpose and you think the magic can help you find your purpose it can but remember it's not it's it makes sense in the end yeah right <laughs> in the long run it's almost <laughs> it's almost like you know when and it is something that happens i think it's it's one of the most important things you can get you can learn from magic is that you know you have just to go in and trust the process and things will, if you stick to the, to the process if you still keep doing your practices you keep doing stick to whatever you set up to do without asking yourself too much about like where i'm going right you will go where you have to right, go right right but, you, I think but if, so you, if you keep mm -hmm. like like if you keep obsessing about you know i want to become a, a, mus a famous musician that is set up for failure yeah, you know yeah. the, the counterpoint the counterpoint of this is that of course magic traditionally has been used to uh, you know to to get, to get money for instance is that kind of like what was being used the most <laughs> yeah uh, that's um, definitely part of the big and, part of that, why i got into it <laughs> and the problem really is that if you like if you're in a position where, uh, where you are broke and you don't have a job it, I'm, I'm not sure that magic can really help you yeah. unless you're able you're able to detach yourself from that yeah thing, and which also is, which is very hard yeah and also you have to do with any magic you have to put the effort in in all ways you know yeah. you do the magic and then you you need to try and cultivate opportunities that could come so it's like absolutely you absolutely, know 100 uh you know when when i do magic for for money it's like i still hustle my ass off with whatever mm -hmm. i can do to just try and help the process along because it's like you know all hands on uh the uh like mitch Hor hands Horowitz says yeah, the, right. the, uh, the kitchen sink approach it's like if you really want something or you, you need something which is the money thing i think at least for me has more been like something i you know i need it it's not like i'm not a money guy i don't give a shit about that i just want to make enough to keep painting to keep going keep yeah, yeah going. Absolutely. that's all i want to do if i could sit in the studio all day and paint the rest of my life i'd be totally happy but i gotta pay all these bills <laughs> but um yeah you know if you if you throw everything you got at it that's gonna you can't do the magic and then just sit back and wait <laughs> you know it's yeah. like it, you know in many ways like if you decide to do magic for money that's the, the time you have to hustle twice as much yeah right like that's that's i mean I, right every right. time i you know every time i do something about this secret uh, i'm gonna share a secret with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know every every time i i know i announce a new course or anything like that which is which is this it has become since the last few years like my full-time job mm -hmm. now um i always you know maybe do a, a conjuration and you know, ask some, some spirit about okay bring success to this endeavor mm -hmm. but that's the moment where you see me on TikTok, on reels yeah all the fucking all the fucking time i i hate it <laughs> i, I know, absolutely right? <laughs> loathe it but like i see i look like a fucking idiot i'm I, a middle-aged man i am with you man pretend. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but but at the same time it is the only promotional avenue i have because I don't have any else. You gotta like, do what you gotta do. And and the thing is that like that the moment you you conjure the spirit, then that's the time where you have to be all the time on reels, yeah. all the time on TikTok, <laughs> all the time on fucking YouTube and whatever. Yeah. Um it's working. Yeah. But at the same time, like every time I hear folks say, Oh well, I've done this this magic for money and nothing happened. Um, well, first of all, what you've done have you right. done like have you have you conjured like a demon and you've never done it before well, maybe that's that right, right. <laughs> or 
<laughs> or you've you've done a sigil well maybe you need to let it go a little bit mm -hmm. another thing that I, li I like to really tell people which i've seen it happen a lot and i don't know maybe uh, this shows how much bad of a marketer i am but i had people come to me and say hey you know i want to sign up for your course the cost i don't know i have served several ones so like the one the, the costier one and uh, and i want i want to because i need money it's like so you want to give me money because you need money. <laughs> no, bro, that's not how it works. Like you, ha you have to keep this money for yourself right. because, you know, I can teach you how to make my things happen with magic. But if you already have this absolute need, well, you have to rethink the approach, right? right? It's, and, and, you know, like every time I say this on podcasts and whatnot, like I get people from the industry, from the industry, it's like five people, it's no industry, but let's say from the industry, say, oh, you shouldn't say these things. Uh, it's like, well, why not? It's true. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, I have a fucking conscience. Right. Uh, and, and it's, and it's also, I know for a fact that the guy that only has like 500 pounds, and he gives me 500 pounds, he will not make it happen because he, he will be too worried about the fact that he doesn't have money. Right. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, he's giving it all it, away for that. Giving it all. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And, uh, and honestly, this is something I would like to see more in this quote unquote industry, <laughs> say. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Uh, yeah. Understood. Understood. Um, I want one thing I want to ask you about is, uh, you know, I'm always trying to find this like parallel between uh, art, specifically dark art, because that's what I'm into. You know, for, for lack of a better term, that's what we call it in the, the make monsters and skulls and mm -hmm. all this typical stuff. Uh, I, I, I love it. Please, please uh, do more. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to stop until I'm dead. Um, uh, but the, the parallel between, I find it interesting that people that are into, into magic generally seem to be attracted to that kind of artwork and the kind mm -hmm. of dark aesthetics. We're both wearing black t-shirts. You see, you know, I went to go see Mitch, Mitch speak the other night. Everybody was wearing black for the most part. It's like, you know, and it's great. You know, this is my feeling too. This is how I express myself. I'm a track. I just like this kind of stuff. And I'm curious to why you, uh, I'm curious what you think, why people into magic, you know, are attracted to like goth culture and, and dark art and, and horror movies, even, you know, it's like, it's, yeah. it is related. It's related somehow. Yet so many of them are, at least the ones I know are very nice people, you know, uh, Something that I noticed over the years is that that has been true for the longest time, right? Like I grew up, I, I, exactly like you, right? I grew up in the 90s and I was attracted to magic because I was also listening to metal and, and then I was listening to goth and then I was into it. And then I started, you know, I shaved on my head and I had a mohawk forever mm -hmm. and then tattoos and then piercings. I used to have a face full of piercings. Yeah. All of that. I right? used to have a septum um, piercing in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, I had this, uh, same, same like you. My face was metal. Now it's all gone, but it was metal. Uh, and, and, the point, and the point is that like, it was like this for the longest time. But I'll tell you something, like if you come to London right now and you go to the uh to the there are three um london um, bookstores here in london esoteric bookstores mm -hmm. you have like threadwells i used to work as a manager there years ago and then you have uh, watkins which is the oldest one and then you have atlantis and he, you will see almost no black dress people mm. it's it's it, it, the tide has changed a lot here mm. uh when i when i was a member of order templariantis here in london uh, I was pretty much one of the very few uh, black clad individuals. <laughs> uh, it was, and I was surprised about that. I don't know if it's a London thing because mm. you know I'm thinking about back in back in Rome, uh, uh, pretty much everybody was a was a metalhead or goth or something like that. Right. But here, here in the UK, it's uh, it's really not like that anymore, or or ever because I you know in the ten years that I've lived here in the UK, I haven't I have, I was always been the only one. Pretty much like I had people, in fact, during when I was a member of OTO coming to me and say, oh, we really need to do something to divorce Telema from metal because we need 
new people and normal people <laughs> and, I, and i was like the fuck <laughs> what <laughs> what are you talking about uh, if you again you know every time i speak about the audio it's always tricky because let's say i don't have um i don't have a very good opinion of the audio anymore mm. but um you know without going too much into that like i've you would find in the audio people dress with you know barber or you know you look as normy as possible uh i i don't know just get the the general uh you know white family mm -hmm. from i don't know from from massachusetts kind of vibe <laughs> and you would find it here uh in the audio uh, so at the same time i do think that uh you know with the exception of the uk possibly <laughs> People, people, people that love dark arts, even if they're like visual arts or music, or not, mm -hmm. they're attracted. They're attracted to the occult, and they're attracted to magic because you know what what really does magic is you know is it goes deep into into the depths of human soul. Right. right. You, you, there's, there's, a, there's this idea of you know uh, this alchemical uh, word which is vitriol, which is which is Latin for Visita interiore terre, rectificando in venius occultum lapidem, which translates means, you know, by going inside the earth, uh, you will find the, the secret stone. And the secret stone is, is an allegory for the stone of the wise, the elixir of long life, the philosopher's stone, right? Mm -hmm. The magic, the great work realized. Right. So this idea that, you know, going into the depths of yourself, you will find that what you're seeking. It's not so much like something you have to seeking the word it's almost like you have to go in, in it's an inward journey right. more than an outward journey and i think that's the same that happens with with those of us who love dark arts like you know where does this um this passion for everything that's obscure obscure maybe a little bit sinister as well mm -hmm. uh it, it is because it i guess we recognize it's part of us it's it's an integral part of the human experience and maybe we've never been scared of it actually we, we loved we, we we wanted to be engaged with it right uh, at least that that has been my experience or, or uh, we're engaging it, with it through our artwork and our music yeah. that's that's how we engage with it in a way that is it, it, safe or, okay. It's safe and sane. Safe yeah, and sane, yeah, exactly. Yeah. As opposed to you know, letting go. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty. I'm not a psychologist, but I'm pretty much convinced that a lot of the the the, the monsters out there, right? I'm thinking about you know serial killers and whatnot. It's because these people have a problem and they are unable to engage with these fantasies in a positive way. Right. Yeah. Right? Totally. And so you know, if for everybody who's able to do that. Well, there's, I think at some point you can make a step a little bit further, or maybe not further, like maybe go to the, to the left or to the right and say, hey, wait a second, I, I can just be more than just somebody who uh, consumes this as, a, as an art form. I can actually become an artist that right. is become a magician. I can actually yeah, right. you know, tap into these depths of my own being and make something out of it. Right. And, yeah. you know, people, people will, some people will become artists, like graphic, uh, visual artists. Some people will become musicians. Some people will also become magicians. Because, again, Crowley famously say that, uh, you know, magic is the science and art of uh, causing change according with your will. But it's a science and an art. Mm -hmm. right? and, I, and I really believe it's so much more an art than it is a science. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, as much as we want to create paradigms on how and theorems on how this work, well, the reality there is that um, it works because it does something. <laughs> like yeah. in the you know in the book of the law, it, it said famously that there's a factor infinite and unknown. That factor fin infinite and unknown is what make magic works, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am I said it many times, and every time I say that, people like hate me for saying it. Uh, but I I don't think science will ever make sense of magic. You know, there's this idea that one day our science will be right. advanced enough. I right. will be able to make sense of everything. I would hate that. I want to have to keep a, an element of mystery. I want to. I want. Well, I want that factor infinite unknown. I well, that's it. that's that's what infinity is. Is that you know you're yeah. never going to get there because it's infinite. Absolutely. You know, so you're always chasing it. You're you know, it's like yeah. it's like the 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 deeper they look, uh, the smaller they go, uh, in in. Uh, matter the weirder things get and it just keeps going yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper and that, yeah. and that is this kind of unknowable thing which is like absolutely always going to be there and, i think otherwise it wouldn't be know, infinity 
And the thing is that like, if you use that, if everything becomes perfectly ordered, uh, which by the way, was the, 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 the aspiration and maybe the delusion of the Victorians, right? Thinking that they, they've ordered the world, everything was fi finished, like the, everything was perfect, everything was done. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, you, if everything is ordered, everything maybe becomes absolutely sterile. There's yeah, no right. possibility for, for growth anymore. Yep. And, I do th and I do think that, you know, you know, that famously you have the four powers of the Sphinx, right? But there's a fifth power of the Sphinx, which is to go. And to constantly go, to always keep going, is what gods do. Famously, you know, the fifth power of the Sphinx is the power of the gods because they go, they constantly go. Well, I want that. Right. right. <laughs> I, 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 if, if, if you tell me, like, well, Marco, you, you, I'm going to give you the, the final understanding of everything, which is 42, as we know. And, <laughs> right, we, you got everything, everything is done. And it's like, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, I cannot really envision it, right? Because it's infinite, obviously. Right. But I, find, I would, I would find it boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like you know, that's like they they talk about you know, you die and go to heaven and sit around and play harps and sit next to God and never, you know, everybody's like, that sounds like the most boring, <laughs> the boring option there is. That's just not. Just uh, being forever in contemplation. But then again, who's that person? Well, we yeah. do metaphysical here. Like, who's <laughs> is that you or is yeah, that right. anyway? <laughs> Uh, I, you know, um, I, I wanted, before I forget, I wanted to mention this is that I did, I, I went to Italy. Mm -hmm. I, I went to Rome. I loved it when I was 18, I think okay. it was my first film I worked on or one of my first films. Uh, the, the blob was my first big film, but this was like a, like a low budget horror movie. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'd never been in an airplane before and I, and I, they flew me out as part of the crew for this crappy ass horror movie called cellar dweller and um and i stayed in a little town called torvionica yeah i know very okay well. <laughs> it was so cool and and it was like this cool old uh hotel on a, on a beach mm -hmm. and uh the people were so amazing it was such a great experience for me really great uh, my mom said i kind of came back a different person like I was a, an adult when I came back, but it was, I just, I loved Rome so much. And, um, uh, it was just, it was such a great experience. At one point I had, a, I, I, I went to this, being this other guy that had, had more experience in Rome. He had worked there a few times, went to this guy's, this old actor's house in this little village that looked like Pinocchio land, mm -hmm. you know, it was so amazing. Windy ass streets and like, Every, you know, it was so cool. And so we went to this guy's house, smoked hash, which I had never smoked before. And I got mm -hmm. so stoned, like t crazy, like, like psychedelic. What, what, was the, what was this? The 90s? This was 80. Okay. Earlier even. Seven, May, 86, uh, 86, uh, I think. Okay. I, I, I was, I, I was a child at the time, so I wouldn't know, but I can tell you in the nineties, there was a good stuff in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so, it was just so cool. It the whole experience was so amazing. Uh, he was this, it was just a trip. What a trip. What a crazy experience. And I just love Rome so much. I want to go back there someday. Um, I haven't, I haven't been in a few years now. Um, and you know what, what I like to, Every time I speak about Rome, I I sound maybe I sound strange to those who who love it because you visited and you have the great experience. But what a, it's kind of like if you live there, you see a completely different. Oh yeah, aspect, I have a friend who right? lives there, and he's yeah. like always telling me how fucked up it is there. <laughs> exactly <laughs> politically uh, it, and like it, you know. In I've been like I said, I, I've been here in the UK in London for the last ten years now, and as much as this country is absolutely not ideal and london has become london really really went down after the pandemic and brexit and everything right and the tw 13 years of tory rule it's it's really bad compared to compared to 10 years ago i've seen the decline right in the last year. tell i tell you it's way better than <laughs> italy <laughs> like, <laughs> in it's the the real problem is that of course italy has a fantastic weather and fantastic food yeah. So, you know, like me and my, my, my partner is also Italian and we're really like evaluating like, okay, do we want to keep staying here? Do we want to go back to Italy? Do we want to go somewhere else? The problem is, the reality there is that in the world we live in, where do you go? I know, <laughs> it's, it's everywhere now. Ev it's like you can't get away from it.
from it, everywhere is bad. I know. Everywhere is shit at the moment, right? <laughs> so we're really thinking about, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, sell everything we don't need. We, we sell, we save, we save some money and then we buy something in a nice place in Italy because it's going to be, it's absolutely going to be like way cheaper than anywhere here. Right. And then at least, at least you get the weather and, but at, but at the same time, you know, you know, I, I like to joke the fact that I'm old when I am only 45 and she's 30. Like we have, we have some, we have some mileage in us still yeah. right? Instead of going, <laughs> going to live in a little village somewhere. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, but yeah. I mean, if you visit it, it's fantastic. It was Rome so cool. Is, yeah, Rome, is, was, Rome is incredible. It was it's so absolutely cool. Incredible. I was there for like three months, but and I was a kid, and it was like my, yeah. like I said, my first time in an airplane, let alone, you know, out of the country. It was such a so great. Uh, but yeah, I know it's so- interesting that that was that was the first time for you because my first time in a plane it was when I was seven, so it was eighty five, few years earlier when I went to. For places Cincinnati because my father was working for Procter and Gamble, mm-hmm. and so we spent some time in Cincinnati, some time in New York, oh, wow. some time in Atlanta, and <laughs> first time I went to the states. Oh wow! <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Many parallels. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, I have a friend who lives there who's like American born, and he flew back. Now he lives there. He, he was he's taking care of his grandmother or kind of helping helping her out. And, um, and I don't, I don't know, my perception f- from what he tells me is like, it's very like isolated, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, you feel like you're kind of cut off from the rest of the world in a way, in a weird way, or, or it's very, mm. I don't know, provincial in a way. And it's super provincial. hard to get all things, it, all, hard to get all stuff it, you want to get and absolutely. mailing stuff is hard and getting stuff in the mails absolutely yeah, yeah. If, like you know i know that you you guys in the states had a, a, a huge problems with the uh, usps in the last few years so, mm-hmm. yeah. well mm-hmm. Im- imagine that times a thousand <laughs> that, that's always been the the problem right. with, with getting mail in italy always yeah right? which is uh, and you know this is one of the reasons why i'm as much as i know that I would love to eventually maybe have a place there again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I have my, you know, my, my, my dad lives in Milan, so I mean, I, I, I have that, right? right? But the point is that like, I would have like, my own place at some point again, because it's not, it's going to be really nice to, to have a place where you can go and spend holidays there, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. But it's, it's really like a logistic nightmare. Um, yeah. It's mail is one thing. Uh, it's like, if you have to like renew your passport or whatnot, Believe it or not, when when I came here, I had to renew my my identity card. I have to fist fight my way into the office. <laughs> You know, you know, like I, I, you know, I, I know that I, I tell the stories and people look at me like, what, what the fuck are you making this up? No, in Rome, if you want to Rome, so we're talking the capital, right? right? If you have, if you want, to, uh, there was this, this was true as of 2013, so maybe there's a change now, but as of 10 years ago, if you wanted to check to renew your identity card, you have to go to, a, um, you know, a, an office that opens at eight, but you have to start queuing at six. Oh my God. To, to, because the one they were opening, you were starting to get into the real queue. But the problem is that you have to queue your way to get there. And then as it opened, like everybody was just drawing, you would just like have to fist fight away <laughs> your way into it. <laughs> and then I always remember that I needed to go that day because, you know, I was flying the next day and I couldn't get any appointment before. So you also have to get an appointment, by the way, which is impossible. Right. And so anyway, I go there and then there was like five people in the queue. The only, the only survivors were five of us. And I was <laughs> number three. And I remember that, that you know, uh, I got to, they, they, they do my, my card and then they start to shut down and, and send the two, the two people behind me home, come tomorrow. And I was like, wow. Oh, my God. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, we only do three a day. So, uh, and I ask, yeah, but, but why? Yeah. It's like. It is, it is. It is like this. I wonder why. I wonder why that is. It seems like you know. I don't know. It's like on a civil service level that things are fucked up or something. Or well, governmental. I, I, you, or... know, you know, I think there is a series of reasons. The fact that you know, Italy, Italy doesn't really exist, in the sense <laughs> that you know, Italy came together. Um, in the in sixty one and then in in, in eighteen sixty one and then eighteen seventy, uh, because what happened there is that it was like the Savoia family from Piemont, they were like 
they they were very rich and the only um, noble family in Italy that was uh, was actually uh, benefiting from the industrial revolution because they had in, in industries there mm -hmm. and so they just you know used went on a pretty much conquest spree across the uh, across the the peninsula and they they had more they had better better um, armies and they won and also you know it's a bit more complex than that yeah, yeah. simplifying it but you know they never cared about creating a very strong uh, and united um, Italian sentiment. Mm. The story that, you know, the uh, Italy came because, you know, the, 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 the grassroots across the regions of Italy really wanted Italy to be one. It's, 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 a, it's a story. It's mm -hmm. not a real thing. <laughs> right? like, so it, just, it was pretty much like a conquest. And uh, what happened there is that... Um, that never, you know, the, the lack, the lack of the real strong cohesive um, identity, kind of cascaded into creating all sorts of problems, right? And for instance, the, the south, the south was governed by the Bourbon family, and so it was very Byzantine, it was very old style. Mm -hmm. And then you have the central states that were like under the influence of what well, the Vatican, really, the, the papal states. So again, a lot of bureaucracy yeah. was very, very, very in the north. It was, it was very uh, much more pragmatic, and so those two realities never really mixed wow you know sad you know sadly when is the only time in italian history which again only italian history you have to start thinking of it in from 1870 mm -hmm. right so right. what 100 and, 170 years something like that not much wow um 150 years actually not much um only during the ventennio the 20 years of fascist rule that was the only time that italy was was really starting to become one thing wow <laughs> because 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 fascism right. was, was was enforcing it right? wow like it's what a, a it's like my way my way or the highway yeah yeah much. yeah wow that's interesting and, and of course that's that's shit. yeah and that's <laughs> and and that's also why in italy you still fascism never really went away right because you you have a lot of folks in italy and i, and I mean that i mean that i mean we have we have pretty much the fascist in government right now All right like you know Melo, uh, the, the meloni like which is like the prime minister she she is now like a right right wing but yeah, yeah she comes from she comes from alianza nazionale which yep. used to be the fascist yep. party yeah <laughs> that's what it is yeah and Crazy, and the thing man. is that sadly like that was the only time though that somehow because it again either you either you uh you went with it or you were beaten to death yeah. pretty much yeah right th that's the only time we start having a little bit of, of cohesive italian sentiment wow and and that's why to this day you still have people that are uh you know melancholic for that period right it's it's fucked up, man. <laughs> I tell you. Yeah, yeah. Very complicated. Everything is so complicated when you look into the causes of yeah. global politics, and it's like so complex, and it's so not simple. You know, it, it, I, I, it, you know, and the, I guess it's it's meant not to be like this. Right? Yeah. Back to magic. I do think that magic can give you. A sort of respite from all of it because magic will force oh, you yeah. to consider complexity and also i i learned that it will force you to accept your own limits like you will magic will force you to remember what we were discussing before about infinite right mm -hmm. you know if you if you keep going onto a magical path you will eventually come to to realize that the that path will never end right It'll always go for it yeah it's almost, you can see you can see like a, like a straight up line i like to see it like a spiral that goes up mm -hmm. and up and up and mm -hmm. up and up and and there will moments that come again and again you know um revelations that present themselves again and again maybe yep. and you have a deeper understanding of yep. them but it keeps on spiraling up yeah and and that's why why at some point you know i for me magic you know taught me that yes the world is complex but I cannot do anything about it. Right. Um, it, I find it, uh, you know, for a while I was actually, I tried to fight it against this realization a lot, like a lot, <laughs> especially in the last, in the last few years, like when, you know, when people were telling me that, you know, we should be friend with, uh, with Nazis because they are the ones that are going to help me against yeah. the establishment. I was like, no, bro, I'm not going to do that. It's not going <laughs> to work for me. No. <laughs> but then I also realized that it's kind of pointless to to discuss it because you know we're talking about layers of complexity yeah that go beyond our ability and yeah. so maybe 
just learning to accept it and learning to wash it over you and try, oh, keep trying to be a decent person if possible. Yeah. Which, uh, maybe I failed many times. <laughs> but <laughs> We all do our best. But I mean, I, I think also it can help you navigate the, the chaos to magic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, really, really uh, any grounded spiritual practice helps you navigate the craziness and at least because you just you can't you can't change it. You can't change it. No. It's like I feel like what's happening in the world now with all this fascism and 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 crazy stuff happening. It's like it's just this this current is just happening right now. Yeah. It's like something is happening and it's just going to play itself out and you can't really do anything about it other than, you know, you could say, you could talk about it. You can, you just can't lose yourself in that and, and, and accept what you, what you think is wrong, but you really kind of have to like navigate it the best you can really. You know, like I said, like in the last few years, I really thought for a while, like, you know, maybe it is my, my duty to maybe sound alarm bells and whatnot. And then I realized, you know, people don't want to hear it. Yeah. People, people, will, people will only listen to someone selling them a solution. All right. right? And right. This, this is why you get, you get a lot of these like you know, cult influencers that will tell you, you know, like everything is terrible, everything is crazy, but I have the solution right. Come with me and I will tell you what to do. <laughs> I, I always say, you know, I don't have any fucking solution. Right? Like, <laughs> what I can tell you is that, you know, I have, I have these practices that make you, you know, make sense of, you know, the, the stress that you might feel. Mm -hmm. but, apart from that, but apart from that, it's, it's down to you to yeah. navigate the chaos, to find, to find maybe yourself in the, in the eye of the storm. But right. also accepting that there's a storm outside yep. and it's going to stay with us for a while. Yep. I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound all doomy, but I don't have like great expectations for the years to come. Yeah. Right. Well, it's always, you know, it's kind of always been this way in a, in a way. I, I feel like yeah. in my in my lifetime, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and, um, you know, I w I've watched America just like slowly deteriorating. <laughs> I remember when I was really little. Cause I was born in 67. So my earliest memories are like 71, 72 when I was really little. And my dad was able to buy a house on just like a, he was a tugboat driver. He was able to buy a house. We had amazing insurance. We used to all go to the dentist on time. Uh, doctors, no problem. And it's like, it just slowly kept getting eaten away. And, uh, and, and, and then the, and in the eighties were like, you know, I know a lot of people were kind of prospering financially, but it was such a, it was a super dark time really for people who are, um, interested in, uh, uh civil rights. And, you know, I, it's yeah. just, it was a, you know, a lot of people thought the eighties were this heyday and it's like, no, I remember when Reagan closed, you know, <laughs> shut down all the mental institutions. And all of a sudden overnight, there was just homeless, crazy people everywhere, mentally ill people yeah, on the yeah. streets. And it's like, uh, so it's, it's kind of, I feel like it's been this way kind of my whole life. It is coming, seems to be coming to a head. Um, but, but it's just the way it's going to go. And, and, and I think that, you know, if having some kind of, I think it's, if anything, it's, it's more important than ever than to have, to have some kind of grounding spiritual practice. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's that and your circle and, 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 and having your circle of friends and family around you and helping each other is that's pretty much it. I, I agree with you. Like, especially when you mentioned about the idea, like this, this immediate circle of people, right. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, in, in the, in the, in the years of like really investing into parasocial relationships, uh, people can get this idea that, Oh, you know, I, I spoke with this person online for like two years. Those are my close friends. You right. know, friendships get friendship can happen there. Yeah. But in my experience, you, it's so good to have actual physical people around yep. you Definitely. that you can ground you. Yeah. And also, you know, also accepting the fact that, you know, as you said, we are always at the end of the world. Like, right. because you know, <laughs> like, like what you mentioned about the seventies, I remember my, and, and sorry about the eighties being, you know, starting to become a very dark time right. for you. US. I remember us, you know, coming from Rome to New York to Cincinnati, which is, you know, it's not like it's a big city, but it's not like, like the place you go. Right. I remember, 
I, it felt to me coming to Disneyland. Everything seems so beautiful, polished and everything compared to Italy. Right, right, right. Compared right. to whatever we had there. So they realized that the perspective change, right? And of course, you know, we are both very lucky to to live in, to, not in a war-torn country right now. But yeah. I, have, like, I have friends in Kiev. I have friends, uh, you know, in, in, other, in, in Armenia, right? And it's, it's, you know, like the world is always ending. That's yeah, really I that. know. Oh, wait, I can't hear you. Okay. Oh, there you go. Sorry, okay. say that again. <laughs> okay, perfect. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's for us in the, you know, in the West that we are, well, my light just. Ended. Yeah, your light went off too. Of, <laughs> fantastic. Okay. Um, it works. But so, so maybe, maybe it's for us in the, in the West that we're, in the, in the West, um, you know, rich countries. Yeah. That we're starting to realize that, ah, maybe things are going to get a little bit hairy again. Yeah, that's true. But, that it. it yeah but that, then again you know like you never know what happens tomorrow right? yeah i know like, i don't know the fucking aliens might come for real and you know solve scarcity and then we're like ah, a new a new dorado <laughs> stars for everybody Any, right? anything and, that's the thing it's like it's so it's becoming i i don't believe like you know everyone's afraid of this apocalypse happening in the mad max end of the world and to me it's like that's almost too easy it's like the, it seems more reasonable that it's just going to keep getting more and more unpredictable yeah. and chaotic and you can't predict it's so chaotic that you can't even predict a decent apocalypse <laughs> you know what i mean, I mean it's, uh, it's like just chaos crazy you know, good good amazing good things amazing horrible mm -hmm. things all happening at the same time you know what I mean? And, and and I really think that it's always been the case. It's yeah, just yeah, that, yeah. you know, maybe we're, we are just seeing more of it also because we are more interconnected trans to true, social media true. and the internet. Now we see more of it. We are more exposed to 24 yeah. seven, like news cycles. Like, you know, true, so true. We, we also, you know, you were saying like, uh, we cannot even predict um, a good apocalypse. It's funny because again, without naming names, let's say that there are people in a culture that have made their small fortunes um, by literally spending every year predicting that the, that the horrible things are going to happen. <laughs> Nothing happens, but you know, and, you know, and then, then they just start the cycle again. Right. Now, People I'm keep giving them money. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm bracing for impact because of course, you know, we're going towards the end of this year. You, you see like around November, December, like the astrological predictions for the next year going right, to come up. And you right. always get this, this doomers that will tell you, oh, everything's going to be bad. And then, you know what? I, no, I mean, things have always been bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It changes and, and humanity has Thankfully, we we learn to adapt, and you know, like if you say this to you know the, the ultra libertarian kind of types, they will say, "Yeah, we learn to adapt. You're just accepting, you know, less freedoms, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. I mean, maybe there's that's part of it, but also the reality is that you learn to adapt. You learn to right. live any any way. Like I remember, you know, my grandparents telling me what they need to do to survive during right. World War Two in, in Italy. You know what? They survived. They yeah. had after that. They had a beautiful life, you know. And and that's that's true. Like the the war keeps going. Yeah. The war while the war is always ending. And as you said, like having having a spiritual practice will help you in many ways. But realizing your the fact that you're minuscule in the in, in the chaos around you, but also that you can you know extricate yourself and see. The universe for that there is and you know like going into those the states of maybe fleeting enlightenment but enlightenment nonetheless right yeah and, and that's that that's that's very good yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can hold on to those fleeting moments for a long time to get you through to the yeah. next one kind of you know because they're so, Absolutely. so powerful uh okay so one last thing because I, I i know it's it's late over where you are um, I appreciate you taking the time f for all this. It's a really great. Time uh, it's been great. <laughs> yeah. I want, so I want one last thing. Um, not, uh, I'm not looking for a pitch, but I am curious why the Lema, why the Lema for you? Uh, did it just resonate with you on just kind of an intuitive, intuitive level, or is it just, you fell into it or, 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 or why, why? To be, 
to be fair, I just fell into it. Um, and it what happened there? It and it and you know, and I found myself into it. Mm -hmm. It was great. Like this is good for me. So what really happened there is that you know, when I was very young, twelve. Uh, in the summer of 1990, actually, uh, I was spending a lot of time on my own, had a lot of time to, to read because a bunch of stuff was happening in my family. And so I was kind of left to my own, on my own devices, right? And um, my father uh, bought me a comic book by this very famous comic book uh, in Italy called Martin Mister, which is kind of like Indiana Jones, but he is, is following mysteries and mm. Atlantis and mm. whatnot. And in, in this comic book of the summer of 1990, there was an extra little booklet about the most mysterious man in the world. And a big chapter was about Aleister Crowley. Yeah. And, you know, I was 12, but I was already starting to go the goth way. Like it would, it would take some more years, but you know, I would <laughs> discover, I would discover, you know, Metallica and then Megadeth and then Tool. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, all the, 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 like, I would go there eventually. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, this guy seems interesting, mm -hmm. right? Um, I really loved the idea that you could be your own god, which which you know at the time I didn't understand. I, I didn't. I, I, I mean, I didn't have the the the, you know, the mental acuity uh, to really get understand what that meant. Yeah. But it wasn't so much about you know I want to be all powerful and fuck the rest of the world. It was more about oh oh, if I am my own god, I don't have to to pray to this other dude that somewhere is gonna save me. I don't need to be saved. I had that, that, that realization. Like I didn't want somebody else to come and save me. I didn't need like a sky daddy. So it's like to, self empowerment. To... Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and you know, and the other thing that happened then is that I found magic and theory practice. In, in in Italy at the time, you didn't have anything translated. And my English, I, I did speak English already because of course I spent some time in the States when I was younger, but I was still like, was still learning really, right? So I had to read in Italian. And uh, the only thing that was available was Magic and Theory in Practice by Crowley. Mm -hmm. And the, then the Kenneth Grant books. And, you know, Magic and Theory in Practice, I read it, didn't understand it. But Kenneth Grant was so enthralling and so f speaking about um, uh, H.P. Lovecraft too, which was something I was reading right yeah, at the yeah. time. And I was like, oh God, this is great. So <laughs> I just I just fell into it and I never left it. Um, That's really cool. What, what, what happened to me is that, you know, it took me, it took me some time to like, if I don't have like a traditional telemite background, right? Because, you know, I, I got initiated into the AA and I stick with that. Still, still, I'm still an active member of OPAA, mm. aspirant, I should say. And then, you know, I reached out when I was 18, uh, well, 20, really, uh, for the OTO people in Rome. I didn't like them. They didn't like me. So I left <laughs> that behind. And then, you know, I went and learned about Michael Bertio and I started working with him. But, you know, Michael Bertio is, yeah, I mean, and I, I reached for Michael Bertio because it was, I thought it was a telemite. In fact, telemite is really something that Bertio does. As a, on the periphery, he really created his own system. It's something completely unique. But then, you know, a few years later, I went and stayed with him for a while in Chicago hmm. and I got initiated. I got consecrated in, in the, the bishophood. And then eventually I came back to the OTO, hmm. which I hope, you know, I wish I never did, but <laughs> because I really, really felt like I wasted my years in there. Yeah. And I got a lot of terrible experience out of it. But in general, so, so yeah, I never felt, I never went into the, oh, you discover Crowley. You reach out for the OTO Lodge, you get initiated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have a very, like, very strange and fragmented right. uh, story. But what happened there is that, you know, I discovered Crowley by complete chance when I was very young. And the message of self empowerment really resonated with me. And I wanted that. Hmm. And here I am. I am, uh, what, 35 years later? 30. <laughs> I, 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 many years cool. <laughs> I, uh, many well, years later <laughs> terrible <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. oh me too 12, 12 minus 4 45 minus 12 when is that 27 years later 27 okay years later. yeah <laughs> you go. don't ask me i'm i'm worse than you at math i guarantee it uh yeah that's really interesting uh yeah, I could I, I could keep going, but I, I'm gonna I I know it's late over there. I'm gonna I'll let you go. But uh, uh, I, let me say one last one last thing. One last thing, please. You please, know, absolutely. <laughs> the thing that that I thought the coolest thing about what I what I know knew about the Lama or what I read about the Lama was this idea that we're going into this new aeon, 
and mm-hmm. it's the Aeon of the Child, and it's like you know, uh, maybe you could just quickly g- go over that because yeah. I because th- that to me was like that makes so much sense to me when you look back at the the different eras we've gone through and how uh, you know uh, initially it was like the the feminine and the masculine, and now we mm-hmm. have the child, the time of the child. But maybe just real quickly, if you could just so uh, super quickly, uh, a super quick lesson on Aeonis. Um <laughs> I just thought that's so cool. The, the idea is that, right, uh, as the time, uh, as time passes, um, different laws for attainment, for spiritual attainment, are given to humanity, okay? Given by whom? Let's say by the gods. Let's mm-hmm. say that, you know, as time passes, uh, different ideas on how to become a spiritually advanced individual uh, become available, okay? And Crowley synthesized this overarching idea of this uh, cyclicity and uh, uh, changeability of um, spiritual advancement with the idea of eons. Now, eon is a term that means both a period of time, of course, but also one of these, these laws as well, these, these formulas of magic, right? So the idea is that each eon is a period of time that also comes with its own set of magical rules to become uh, a spiritual advanced individual. Uh, You can think of it as, let's say like um, an operating system, right? You have the computer or the the iPhone or whatever, right? And as time passes, you know, new operating systems are released. You can still use the old ones, but maybe as time goes by, they become less and less, um, you know, performant. Mm-hmm. And so you might want to update to the new ones, right? But this is like on, on, on a long period of time. And Crowley, you know, gave this vision of three fundamental eons, which was the eon of Isis or eon of the matter, which is almost like a prehistorical, maybe high historical eon where, you know, matriarchal societies and a focus on, no, on nature um existed famously we don't really have a lot of anthropological or archaeological evidence that this ever happened we know now that there has been matriarchal societies we know that there has been like cults of the great mother Mm -hmm. or cults of nature but we don't really have enough true evidence that this there was like a a far-reaching constantly happening all across the world right it was more like scattered around then uh, the second eon is the eon of the father and that's the patriarchal societies that we all know because that's what history is all about and that's in many ways that's the world we still live in right, right? in many ways like kind of coming out trying to trans trying to get to exact, the next you know in the middle the of getting one. to that next one and then the, the 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 eon of the child or the eon of horus uh it is the eon that has been inaugurated by crowley in uh, april of 1904 so 120 19 years ago now with the reception of the book of the law and the idea is that the eon of the child is an eon of force and fire is an eon of almost childhood rebellion which is which implies a lot of energy a lot of youthful energy but also the kind of energy that maybe is not always wise so it's a bit it's a bit like you know something that's cooking but it's something it could explode at at any time (laughs) and and crowley crowley famously said in in one of of his um commentaries to the book of the law he tried to wrote a lot of commentaries to the book of the law he deleted them all Uh, he tried again and he was never happy with them Mm. in the end like the only comment you have in the book of the law right now is what you find in every printed edition which pretty much tells you you should read it for yourself uh, you should not discuss it B- burn this book it's better for you <laughs> something like that right? <laughs> it's kind of maybe, maybe maybe you know maybe that's a test right? yeah <laughs> um, but but at the same time and so like in one of his commentary he would say that he, he was writing this in the 40s so towards the end of his life and looking back at the, the last 40 years it would say like maybe this is indeed the year of Horus, the year of the child because we had wars the world war one world war two like, right. met, like and uh, so like a lot of things was happening but the idea is that okay, these things needs to happen right in order for for something new to come up and of course we also have this idea of a future year well future years including the next one which should be the year of of Tmais or Matt and this idea that like we don't really know much about this uh various occultists like Nema uh, and Frater Akkad uh, try to 
to uh, let's say have glimpses of what the end of math could be and a lot of people um, in the contemporary telemic um, movements insist on the idea that possibly the end of math is actually coexisting right now already with hmm. the end of Horus. Hmm. So my, my point is that as I write in the book, right, I write about all of this and then there's a part that's saying, what if it is all made up? <laughs> <laughs> the, and the point is that like, um, it doesn't matter if it's all made up. Right. It's, an interesting, it's an interesting way of framing the idea that spiritual evolution is tied to specific magical formulae and this magical formula change as time goes right. by. It doesn't mean that, you know, once something, well, it doesn't mean that, for instance, right now in the universe, you cannot use or you cannot have success with formulas up, uh, from the universe iris. Famously, we discussed about it all day because it's what well, is in my book. All the practices in my book, apart of a couple, a couple uh, all the rituals that you do, they are, in fact, golden dawn rituals that have been right. telemized in right. a way. And those are the formula of the Yon of Osiris, so right. the previous, uh, the Yon of the Father. It's only, you know, by doing a little changes here and there, and then maybe adding those um, entry-level telemic rituals, that then you also start to feed in the formula of the new Yon. Because the, formula, the new Yon being still a very you know um infant eon mm -hmm. uh, in order to really being able to use it fully you have to be more advanced so it's not so much like an, a novice thing there are novices novice level rituals like liber vive regularly famously it's suggested to be like a, the ritual for a magician of, of any grade i would still suggest complete novices not to go too much into it because it's a very very fire ritual and mm -hmm. i'm like I, if you want to torture your life, go ahead. <laughs> if you want to have that approach where it's like, you know, like I really need a change in my life. Yeah. And the only way to, it's like in and the Neubauten kind of approach and destroying like yeah, everything to burn it all down. Start a, <laughs> that's good for you. Maybe not. Or maybe people want a little bit more like nuanced approach. Right. But you know, in, in a nutshell, this is what Aeonics are. Um, I really like the idea. That's a, one of uh, another idea that I always resonated with with something many people don't know is that you know this is something that Crowley got inspired from well definitely from theosophy and theosophy got inspired from you know Hinduism mm -hmm. the idea of the yugas you know change you yep. know, Kali Yuga famously like yep. being uh, the 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 eon of lead we're living right now in but also by something called dispensationalism dispensationalism was uh, a set of like a philosophy uh, that was, was coming from this guy called Darby. I don't remember his real Thomas Darby. I don't remember his real his um, um, first name, but last name is Darby. And Darby was one of those of the thinkers of the exclusive brethren, right? And this idea that you know Darby saw dispensationalism as the idea that through the history you would have different dispensations coming from the Holy Spirit about how to interpret the scriptures. So it's still very Christian, still very right. you know. Uh, but this idea that, you know, as time pass, pass, new interpretations of the scripture could come from enlightenment, pretty mm -hmm. much. So Crowley definitely got a little bit of that because he was definitely exposed to, to dispensationalism. But then obviously also from Hinduism and the idea of yugas and theosophy, which was kind of blending everything. Interesting. Together. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for talking about that. Like. I, hopefully you can come up, come back again sometime. Um, Absolutely, anytime, man. I, I loved it because <laughs> uh, I, I just you know I'd love I'd, I'd, you're you're uh, very knowledgeable on this and uh, I appreciate it. I, I love listening to you speak. Um, yeah, so t tell people where uh, they can find your work. I'll put I'll put the description in, in the link as well in the bi in the you know the text. But uh, tell people where they can find your work. So, uh, first of all, if you want to get in touch with me, I am on social media anywhere you can find me, and I try to reply to all messages. Um, I do get a lot of them. Uh, you know, it's like, I, as, as soon as the book came out, I really saw like a spike in mm -hmm. messages, which is, is always, I like it. So, if I don't re respond immediately, like please bear with me, but I will get to it. Yeah. Uh, but I have a website, marcovisconti.org, and over there you'll find uh, pretty much all the links to to my courses. So basically, I um, 
I teach online everything we discussed tonight pretty mm-hmm. much in a structured way um, on uh, Mighty Networks. Mighty Network Networks is a platform that it's almost like uh, it's it's something akin to Facebook, but without being Facebook. Let's put it like that. Okay. And it's private, so, so it's like it's my own private Facebook, if you cool. want. And um, and so basically, like you can join uh, you everybody everybody who's got the book, also the audio book. At the end of it, you have a link to join for free uh, and you can have a just general idea of what we do there. Oh, great. And then, and then, you know, we have, I have right now I have three courses out and three single classes and, you know, course, the courses goes by um, magic without tears is the course that pretty much is the book in course form. Mm. Right. With, cool. with, and then, then I have one, I think called thought tarot magic where I, Teach the thought, the thought tarot via path working. So if you're interested in in the in in tarot and you want to learn more than just reading the cards, but having like you know magical experiences with the major arcana, that might be for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, in October, well, we, we're we're literally a month from now. So we're recording to, on the 25th of September. In in a month from now, 26th of of October, I will start um, a new course called the Holy Guardian Angel Experience. Oh, cool. Which is which is kind of going to be like the next step, mm-hmm. right? Okay, you've done you've done the stuff in the book, right? Maybe you 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 studied the tarot uh, a bit deeper. Now these are going to be a bit of history on the on the concept of the Holy Garden Angel, so where it comes from, how it evolved across the the centuries, uh, and then I'm always going to give a little bit of practical exercises. Um, not so much bec- because I can teach you how to get there. That's something very personal, yeah. as we. We'll discussed every night yeah. all, all night long <laughs> but i you know you can you can have you can have little glimpses and you can have little experiences of okay this is what it would be to to have to perform liber samic this is what we would be to to perform the abramelian operation etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera, right. right i think i think like if you if you're interested in magic that's a little bit more more advanced and and actually can really give you a big jump in your experiences that's gonna be it um uh, this is also something that i never done it before right so it's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be I, i'm ex- i'm excited as yeah. well because i always like always like to break new grounds pretty much it sounds like yeah mark mark marco visconti.org you'll find literally everything everything okay is there. excellent well um yeah i recommend people go and check it out as soon as i get my taxes paid I'm going to probably join up and <laughs> buy well, some courses. It's going to be great to have you. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. I'll, I'll let you go. Don't hang up. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Really enjoyed it. We'll do it thank again. Thank you very much. We'll do it again soon, hopefully. Um, Absolutely. And then just, just say goodbye to everybody, just in your own special way. Goodbye. Well, uh, <laughs> buonanotte e ci vediamo tutti presto. Perfect. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening, buddy.